God is omniscient and God knows we're praying, and so he's, he's also omnipotent. He can certainly make a saint aware of it if someone is asking for that saint's intercession. Um, that's the standard understanding. It seems the most plausible given what we know, or at least it's a possible way for it to happen. Uh, you know, we don't really know a huge amount about what means of learning things that the saints have. Now, presumably, since they don't have their bodies with them in heaven at the moment, um, presumably they can't hear physically our prayers. So whether it's silent or oral prayer, it's not really going to matter to a saint because they don't have ears right now. And even if they did, they're not here physically, locally, and so you know they couldn't hear naturally anyway. Um, so it's possible that God lets the saints have other, you know, some kind of spiritual sense that we don't really understand, perhaps along the lines of what angels have, but we don't know that. What we do know is that they're in union with God, God knows our prayers, and God can make them aware of it. And so that's the standard understanding in theology of how saints would be aware of our prayers, whether spoken or not. Okay, Daniel? Oh, yep, God's right. sort of like a switchboard. Is is Saint Robert Bellarmine one of your patrons? Um, no. Oh, because you said Saint Bob. I, just used Saint I was. Bob. Just, oh, I see. I was wondering. All right, thanks so much, uh, Steve in Lake Charles, Louisiana, listening on Immaculate Heart Radio. Uh, you are on with Jimmy Aiken. Yes. Hello. Um, first off, I'm. I don't believe in sola scriptura, but I often get questioned by Protestants. So, my question about um, free will is. Is it scriptural? And mm -hmm. secondly, um, on this this program this week, I've heard people say that God cannot lie and mm -hmm. that Jesus could not sin. So my question about that is, does God have free will? Okay. Uh, in regard to the first question, the term free will is a theological term. It developed in theology after the writing of the New Testament, so you won't find the term free will in Scripture, but then you won't find a lot of other theological terms in Scripture either. You won't find the term Trinity in Scripture, because that's even though the concept of the Trinity is in Scripture, the word is of later origin. Similarly, the word Bible isn't in Scripture. That's another term that came along much later. And so even though the books of the Bible are Scripture, they don't use the word Bible in them. Um, so it's the same with free will. Uh, free will is a later theological term, but it describes a reality that is found in Scripture. And this is indicated uh, by a number of passages. One of the things that happens all over the place in both the Old and the New Testament is people are exhorted to do stuff. Thus, for example, in, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy, you have uh, God telling the Israelites that he's set life and death before them, therefore choose life. Well, that means they have a choice. He's not forcing them to do one or the other, um, and so that presupposes that they have a choice, or a genuinely free choice, or free will. In the same way, uh, whenever the New Testament exhorts anybody to do anything uh, rather than something else, you know, um, that's another illustration of the biblical reality of free will even though that term hadn't been invented yet. So yes, it's, uh, it's a, a biblical um, uh, concept. In terms of God having freedom, again, you know, the term is, is a later one, but God clearly has freedom, and this is something that is um, emphasized particularly in some later theological documents that talk about how, for example, God didn't have to create the world, that was a free choice on his part. He did it out of love for, for us and to display his glory, but he didn't have to create the world. He was all-sufficient in and of himself, and so he had no need to create the world. However, God's actions are consistent with his nature, and his nature is to be all good. And that explains why God can't lie or otherwise sin, because those would involve logical contradictions. Uh, divine omnipotence means that God can do anything that is logically consistent 
it doesn't mean he can do anything you can say, because there are some things you can say that contain logical contradictions, and if you think about them, they're just gibberish. For example, um, a, the concept of a square circle or a married bachelor, both of those concepts involve logical contradictions. Something can't have both a square perimeter and a circular perimeter and have only one perimeter. So a square circle is nonsense. Same thing with a four-sided triangle or a married bachelor. You can be married or a bachelor, but you can't be a married bachelor. So statements like God can make a married bachelor is just logical gibberish. And so God could make married people, God could make bachelors, but it's not within the scope of omnipotence to say God could make a married bachelor. That's just gibberish. And in the same way, the idea of an all-perfect, all-good being sinning, whether it's the sin of lying or something else, it's also gibberish. Uh, an infinitely holy God that sins. You know, that's logical gibberish. And so, consequently, God can do anything that's logically possible, but he can't sin because that would contradict his, uh, his nature as an all-holy God. And so the idea of an all-holy God sinning is just more co conceptual incoherence, just like four-sided triangles and married bachelors. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so, but that, there's lots of choices that don't involve sin, however. Exactly. So, any, so you, any choice right. that's not logically contradictory, God could, God could, God could make. Rob in Norwalk, Connecticut, listening on EWTN Radio. Rob, you are on with Jimmy Aiken. Hello. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Yeah. So um, I had a question about um, people that are, you know, mentally not, you know, not with it and their ability to receive sacraments. Okay. Um, and also kind of, um, so... You know, I see I see people that um, are um, you know um, mentally challenged or you know with Down syndrome and things like that that mm -hmm. receive communion and use that analogy um, with my mom. My mom has Alzheimer's, okay. and um, she was she was brought up um, Lutheran all her life. Mm -hmm. um, I was brought up Catholic, mm -hmm. and um, I'm kind of hoping that. You know, maybe she could receive communion um, and or, you know, sacraments like that. Um, and, you know, when it's time, receive um, uh, anointing of the sick and um, uh, funeral yes, mass and things like that. Okay. Is, um, let, me, let me ask you a question. Um, does your mom at this point have lucid periods? Um, yes. Okay. A little bit. Not really. I mean, okay. yes and no. Well, here's what I can tell you. Um, in terms of, and you can look this up in the Code of Canon Law, it's online. The place you want to look is Canon 844. And according to the Code of Canon Law, uh, non-Catholics who are coming from the Protestant tradition are able to receive three of the sacraments, um, uh, confession, and the Eucharist and the anointing of the sick, provided certain conditions are met, such as uh, danger of death or other grave necessity, and provided they ask for them on their own, not under, not under compulsion, and provided they have the Church's faith in the sacraments and are properly disposed. So, in principle, your mom could receive those three sacraments, confession, Eucharist, and anointing of the sick, um, provided she meets those conditions. Now, in the case of a person with Alzheimer's, how are those conditions to be interpreted? That's something that people can have different views on canonically, and so um, it's going to depend on whether a priest uh, believes that she's adequately satisfied those conditions. Um, so if she has a, some lucid moments or partially lucid moments, you could say, Mom, would you like to receive these sacraments from a Catholic priest? And, uh, you know, if she says yes, then uh, you could present that as evidence to a priest. Um, he 
Uh, you could also, you know, to help make sure she satisfies the conditions, you could say, Mom, you believe that Jesus is really in the Eucharist, don't you? And she, you know, being raised Lutheran, would presumably assent to that. Also, you could say, Mom, uh, would you like the priest to absolve you of your sins? Do you believe God can do that for you? If she says yes, you'd fulfill that condition. There's more to be said on this, so I'll uh, deal with it on the other side of the break. Open Forum today on Catholic Answers Live, 888-318-7884 is the number. I am your host, Cy Kellett, answering your questions today, Jimmy Aiken, and we'll be right back on Catholic Answers Live. Catholic Answers Live. Hi, this is Trent Horn, and I'm here to tell you about my new book, Hard Sayings, a Catholic approach to answering Bible difficulties. Have you ever read something in the Bible that confused you? Or has a skeptic ever asked you to explain a scandalous passage and you didn't know what to say? Doesn't Genesis contradict science? Why does the Bible promote slavery? How could God order his people to kill women and children? It's happened to just about everyone. But now you have a place to turn for the answers. In Hard Sayings, I look at dozens of the most confounding passages in Scripture and offer clear, reasonable, and Catholic keys to unlocking their true meaning. After reading this book, you'll be equipped to answer the toughest questions skeptics ask about the Bible. So don't be left without an answer again. Order your copy of Hard Sayings today by calling 1-888-291-8000, by visiting the shop at catholic.com, or by asking for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. It's been called a crash course in salvation history, the perfect addition to CCD and RCIA reading lists. Catholic Answers' new graphic novel, The Big Picture, has set the Catholic book world on fire with its unique and innovative blend of apologetics and entertainment. With high quality, full color illustrations and a storyline that's easy to follow, The Big Picture reveals a story full of passion, suspense, adventure, and hope, engaging the reader immediately as our heroes come face to face with the drama and mystery of God's plan for the salvation of the world. It gets readers talking and thinking, captivating and entertaining them with eternal truths presented in a non-threatening way. Get your friends and family talking about things that matter. Order your copy of The Big Picture today by calling one 291 8000 logging on to catholic.com, or asking for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live, open forum today. When we went to the break, Jimmy Aiken was addressing Rob's question about his mother, who has Alzheimer's, receiving uh, communion. So you want right. to pick up where we were? Yeah, so Rob mentioned that his mom uh, has a Lutheran background, and I was discussing the conditions under which uh, someone coming from a Protestant background could receive certain sacraments. It is possible. Um, there are certain conditions. One of them that I didn't mention before the break is the need not to be able to approach a minister of her own communion. But since in the Lutheran Church these sacraments are not valid, um, that condition would seem to be fulfilled by that very fact. She can't validly receive these sacraments from someone in her own communion. Um, in terms of the others, one would want to do what one can to, in a lucid moment, make sure that mom would like to receive these, and also make sure that she shares the Church's faith in them, at least in the sense of, you know, believing in the Real Presence and uh, wanting to accept healing and forgiveness through the sacraments if it's God's will to give those to her through the sacraments. Um, and then you need to, you know, show a Catholic priest or be able to, you know, in, give whatever evidence a Catholic priest needs that this is the case, and then he could do these things. Uh, particularly uh, when it's when she's nearing death, um, although Alzheimer's is itself a grave illness, and so she could receive the sacrament of the anointing of the sick right now. Um, also, when she is near death, she could also receive um, the apostolic... Uh, uh, there's a plenary indulgence that's offered, um, and she could receive that for those who are, who are dying. And then uh, once she does pass, it's totally possible for her to have a funeral mass. Uh, funeral masses are not restricted to Catholics, and so she could absolutely have a funeral mass with no problem. Thank you very much for that uh, call, and uh, thank you to all of you listening, or excuse me, watching on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, Periscope. Every now and then we get a 
question typed into us there. Jimmy Michelle, uh, watching us on Facebook Live, asks the following. I have been told that since Jesus took his apostles away from their families, mm -hmm. that divorce must be okay in certain circumstances. How would you respond to that? I would say that's absurd. Um, Jesus, uh, okay, so when Jesus invited the apostles to follow him, he didn't invite them to divorce their wives, okay? They, this was a job. They had a traveling job, just like lots of other people have traveling jobs. Uh, if people are in the military and they get deployed, for an, even for an extended period of time, they're away from their family because of their job, but that doesn't mean they abandon their family and get divorced. Um, and in, throughout history, there have been lots of jobs that took people away from their families, but it didn't mean that you lost your responsibilities as a parent or a husband or a wife, for that matter. Um, and so the fact that Jesus offered the, uh, the apostles the opportunity to follow him and have a job that would lead them to travel extensively doesn't mean that they were divorced. And in fact, it doesn't mean they, that their wives didn't come, because we know that at least after the resurrection they frequently did. And we know that because in um, his letters to the Corinthians, St. Paul talks about this, and he says that, um, that he and Barnabas are not married, but he says, don't we have a, a right to, to bring a believing wife along with us, like Peter and James and the other apostles? And so it's clear that uh, the married apostles did take their wives with them uh, on missionary trips. And so the fact that Jesus uh, invited them to have this missionary-type job doesn't mean that they weren't married or that they got divorced or anything remotely like that. Now, having said that, divorce is okay in some circumstances. The Catholic Church acknowledges that there can be situations where, uh, for various reasons, it becomes impossible for two spouses to reasonably live together, and in those situations, then divorce, you know, civil divorce, may be a responsible solution to their situation, but a civil divorce does not bring with it the right to remarry. And this passage in, in uh, or the, the passages in the New Testament that indicate Jesus invited the apostles to lead a missionary life, it, it doesn't mean that, as we said, that, uh, that they didn't have their wives with them. It doesn't mean that they were divorced. And it certainly doesn't justify divorce and remarriage which is something that Jesus specifically condemned. And if you can see that, for example, in uh, Mark chapter 10. Thank you very much, Michelle. And again, thank you to everybody who's joining us on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, or Periscope. We go now to Anthony in Kansas City, Missouri, listening on the Immaculate Heart Radio app. Anthony, it's open forum, and you are on with Jimmy Aiken. What's your question? Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, my question is actually about the nature of man. Okay. Uh, I've got a Protestant friend, a co-worker actually, that I've been talking to recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we got on the topic of what the nature of man is, and you know, I tried to explain body and soul as one singular unity. But it seems that his background, that he comes from one of those sort of uh, non-denominational Protestant backgrounds, his idea is of man as sort of this three-part being of body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. And kind of where we're at in our discussion is that he has no real good reason to sort of give that up so he can mm -hmm. try and, you know, examine b the body-soul, you know, the sort of classical Western Catholic concept okay. of the nature of man. Okay. So I was wondering if you could give me some ideas on how to approach that with him. Yeah, um, the fundamental thing here is to recognize that the these terms, the relevant terms in... Uh, in Hebrew and in Greek and in English um, can be used in more than one way. Um, in, uh, in Hebrew, for example, the word, uh, the word nefesh can mean spirit or soul, um, but it gets used differently in different cases. And uh, an ex a particular example of that is in Genesis, where God first 
makes Adam. I mean, he forms the body out of the dust of the ground, and he breathes into his nostrils the spirit of life. Um, the word for spirit is um, in Hebrew is ruach. And then it says, Adam became a living soul. And so there, the word soul is used to refer to the complete Adam, uh, both in body and in spirit. Um, he, you have the body made out of the earth, you have the spirit of life breathed into his nostrils, and thus he becomes a living soul. And the word soul is used to refer to the entirety of Adam. Uh, you see the same usage in English when you have a situation like uh, a ship sinks and you read that 50 souls were lost. Well, the, there the word soul, even though it can also refer to a part of man, is being used to refer to everybody. It didn't mean that their souls vanished, but their bodies are still alive and just fine along with their spirits that are there. The soul is being used in that case as a representation of the whole person. And so you have to be careful that even though some of these terms can be used to refer to parts, um, they also can be used in other senses, and they can overlap. Um, you find instances where um, where soul and spirit seem to be used interchangeably. And so that means you need to kind of take a step back from the particular terms and say, what picture do we have of man presented to us in Scripture? And what's our own experience? Um, in, in, in human experience universally, there seem to be two primary aspects to us. There's our bodies, we're all aware of our bodies, and there's our interior mental life. Um, and in every language you look at, there's always a word for body. I mean, it may not be quite the same, but it'll be something like flesh, if it's not body. Um, but there'll be a way of referring to our outward physical part, and there'll also be a way of referring to our invisible part our mind, our soul, our spirit, however you want to say it, there, there are these two clusters of terms. And that points to there being two fundamental dimensions to the human person. This is true just by natural reason, because it appears in all languages and all cultures. There's always these two ways of referring to different aspects of our being. Um, but there's th there can be multiple terms multiple ways of referring to a single aspect of us. Like in English, I could say my body, or I could say my flesh, or I could say my physical side. Well, that's all one thing. I just used three different ways of describing it, but it's all one thing. In the same way, I could refer to my mind, or my intellect, or my spirit, or my soul. Well, that's four different descriptions, but it's all w referring to one aspect of my reality. And so when you approach the biblical languages, sure, you will find words like body, you'll find words like flesh, you'll find words like soul, you'll find words like spirit, but fundamentally, it's still the material versus the immaterial side of us that, um, that these, uh, those are the buckets that these different terms go in. And our fundamental experience is still as dual beings, not as threefold beings. I mean, maybe God has made beings that have a material, an immaterial, and a something other kind of part somewhere in the universe, but it's not us. We have a fundamentally dualistic experience of ourself, and that's reflected in the terms we have. And so um, you need to not just say, well, hey, we have the word soul and the word spirit, and that means there are two different parts. You have to consider, do they both refer to the same thing, or are they frequently used to refer to the same thing? Now, maybe on some occasions they have different nuances. Just like in English, if I talk about my mind and I talk about my spirit, that's, they, they have different nuances. I mean, they're still referring to my immaterial side, but they have different nuances. That doesn't mean I've got three parts, a, a mind, a spirit, and a body. Um, and, uh, and in the same way, spirit and soul maybe at times do refer to different aspects of our immaterial side, 
but still fundamentally we have an immaterial side and a material side and that's what we mean when we talk about man being dualistic and having a body and a soul or a body and a spirit. It's just the way these terms are being used. And so rather than be dogmatic about the way the terms are used, because they can be used in different ways, I'd say take a step back, think about human experience and language, including the way language is used in the Bible, and you'll see that it presents us with a fundamentally dualistic picture of man. We just don't have a lot of passages drawing sharp distinctions between soul and spirit and indicating that they're two radically different things or parts in man. Thank you, Anthony. It's Open Forum today on Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken is taking your calls. More of those calls when we come back in just a minute. Call us now with your question on Catholic Answers Live. How can a human woman be God's mother? Where in the Bible does it say that Mary was sinless and a perpetual virgin? What can I do to build and deepen my relationship with Mary as my spiritual mother in heaven? In 20 Answers Mary, you'll find biblical evidence for Marian doctrine and devotion, answers to common objections to Catholic teachings about Mary, and guidance on how to imitate Christ as you get to know the Blessed Mother like you've never known her before. 20 Answers Mary is part of the 20 Answers series from Catholic Answers, offering hard facts, powerful arguments, and clear explanations of the most important topics facing the Church and the world, all in a compact, easy-to-read package. Visit shop.catholic.com today and take a look at this exciting new series from Catholic Answers Press. We have a big problem. Our culture is dying, and souls are in danger of being lost. The answer is conversion to Jesus Christ in His Church. St. Paul Street Evangelization is a Catholic organization and we have hundreds of teams spreading the good news throughout the country. But we need your help. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Find out more and get involved today at streetevangelization.com. That's streetevangelization.com. The Catholic Answers Minute. I'm Father Vincent Serpa. In Mark 8, 27, as Jesus walked with his disciples, he asked, Who do people say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. But you, he said, who do you say that I am? Peter responded, You are the Christ. Jesus then warned him not to tell anyone about this. Then he explained that he would have to suffer greatly, be killed, and in three days rise. He was definitely not the kind of Messiah people wanted and expected. They wanted a triumphant Messiah who would triumph over their enemies. Instead, they were getting a suffering servant Messiah who was to conquer by a love that was sacrificial. So often we don't understand the directions our lives seem to take because we too expect Him to be a Messiah who enables us to vanquish all opposition. Instead, we find a Messiah who invites us to love through sacrifice. Such love can transform us into the loving persons He created us to be. I'm Father Vincent Serpa for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. Call now with your question, 888-318-7884. This is Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back to Open Forum on Catholic Answers Live. Almost 750 people have now taken the 20 Answers Challenge just in the first two weeks that we've been making that challenge. Here's how it works. When you purchase the sampler of all 20 books of the 20 Answers series, we take off half price. And then we're challenging you to finish, finish them all this Lent and Easter season. That gives you until June 4th. I have to tell you, I already have a head start on you, uh, so you're going to want to get in on this. This applies to the regular books or the ebooks. But then, after you get the half off and all, take the challenge, in addition, $10 from each set purchased will provide materials to our friends at St. Paul Street Evangelization so they can do what they do, which is take the Street evangelization. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, those who take the challenge uh, win. Those who get the benefit of the St. Paul Street evangelization win. And uh, if you don't get uh, started on this, I'm going to win. I'm going to get all these books read before you do. They, you just go to catholic.com to the shop, and you'll get half off on the whole 20 Answers collection, or go to one 291 8000 and uh, get it there. Half off for the rest of this month on all of the 20 Answers, uh, or the, uh, that is, on the whole collection of the 20 Answers books, one of which you wrote, yeah, and it's I, Salvation. I wrote the Salvation one. Have you read that one yet? I have not. I started, though. Okay. I did, I, but I haven't. 
Okay. I, we'll save that one for later. I was going to say, you want to you want to maybe get all the Trent Horn ones out of the way before you get to the... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Look at this pile. Whatever strikes your fancy. That's that's the Trent Horn pile. He wrote Is nine it? of them. Hmm. Yeah. He's been very, very busy. He and Jim Blackburn wrote the I've most. I've been busy, too. I write... Bigger well, you books. wrote this book. I wrote bigger books. A daily yeah. <laughs> look at this. Let's see. Compare now. We won't compare them, but a daily defense: three hundred sixty-five days plus one to becoming a better apologist by Jimmy Aiken. Mm-hmm. Available now at Catholic.com. We now go to Allie in Columbus, Ohio, uh, listening on the website. Allie, you are on with Jimmy Aiken. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Just fine. What's your question? Good. Um, I'm watching a series on Formed.org called "Baptism in the Holy Spirit and Fire." Okay. And I'm about, I'm about halfway in, and it's really a great series, and I'm enjoying it. But it's, what I, I, I didn't one, get one question: I'm not familiar with Formed.org. Is it a Catholic website or non-Catholic? It's a Catholic website. Okay. And um, each church receives its own password, so you can get on and watch. Um, if there are all mm-hmm. kinds of Bible studies on there, a lot of interesting things. Okay. And you said you're watching um, one on baptism. In, in yes, the Holy it's Spirit? by the Wild Goose. It's called Baptism in the Holy Spirit and Fire. Okay. And it's a really great series. I'm enjoying it. Mm-hmm. But when I researched Baptism in the Holy Spirit on the Internet, mm-hmm. it comes up Charismatic Movement mm-hmm. and Charismatic Renewal. So my question is, would I have to join a Charismatic uh, group in order to receive the Baptism in the Holy Spirit and Fire? Okay. Or, or can you just receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit through prayer? Okay. Um, well, um, I haven't seen the series you're talking about. I'm not sure who the wild goose is. Um, but uh, I can tell you that you probably want to be a little careful in this area, because the phrase baptism in the Holy Spirit or baptism of the Holy Spirit or spirit baptism or similar phrases um, have been used in a different sense in uh, Pentecostal and Charismatic circles than they're used in the Bible. In the Bible, when uh, the phrase, baptism in the Spirit and fire, that's from the Gospels. Specifically, it's from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, because John the Baptist talks about how he's baptizing with water, but the one who comes after him, Jesus, is going to baptize in the Spirit and fire. And there's a question about what both of those are referring to. Obviously, um, John the Baptist recognizes that Jesus is going to be bringing a baptism, and it's going to be in some way different than John's baptism of water. So did Jesus bring a form of baptism? Sure. Did it also involve water? Yes. So that would suggest that when John is talking about how I baptize with water, but he's going to baptize with the Spirit. He's meaning he's he's not meaning Jesus is not going to baptize with water. He's meaning he's going to baptize with more than water. And so whereas John's baptism only involves water, Jesus' baptism involves water and the Spirit. And that seems to be reflected in John chapter 3, where Jesus talks about how you must be born again of water and the Spirit. And then immediate, and that seems to be a reference to water baptism, because then immediately you turn the page into John chapter 4, and it's all about how Jesus is baptizing, although it's, it's, John points out it's really his disciples who are doing it. So as a result of all of that, Christians down through the ages, and the Church today, has understood the reference to s- baptism in the Spirit as a reference to water baptism. Um, the fire aspect... There's been some more debate about. Uh, One of the things that uh, is a possibility here is um, because John the Baptist also talks about how Jesus' winnowing fork is in his hand and how he's going to uh, put the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he's going to burn with unquenchable fire, that could be a reference to divine judgment. And so what John the Baptist may be saying is, I'm just baptizing with water, which isn't effective, but when Jesus comes, you either get baptized with water in the Spirit, or if you refuse Christian baptism, knowingly and deliberately, then you'll be, then you'll be baptized with fire, you'll experience divine judgment. That's another possibility here. It's not the only one, but it's one of them. In uh, the late 
uh, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, though, in the Protestant community, another way of using the term spirit baptism came into existence, though. Um, and that use points to an experience of the Holy Spirit that one receives after conversion. So it would be after you put your faith in Jesus, after you've been baptized, at some later point in the Christian life. And um, and this is the use that you find in a lot of charismatic circles, and it's kind of spilled over into Catholic charismatic circles. Now, are there experiences of the Holy Spirit that occur after conversion? Sure, absolutely. We read about them in Scripture. Um, scripture doesn't use the phrase spirit baptism to refer to them, but it acknowledges that we can receive the Holy Spirit in a variety of different ways later in life. And so it's quite possible to experience a more, to have a more profound experience of the Holy Spirit. One can pray for that. In fact, in charismatic circles, that's typically how it's done. I mean, there's a, there'll be a prayer service asking, you know, for God to give the Holy Spirit to someone in a more profound way, and, and, and God can grant that. So it's possible to have a deeper experience of the Holy Spirit just praying on your own. It's possible to have a deeper experience of the Holy Spirit through the sacraments. It's possible to have a deeper experience of the Holy Spirit with other people praying for you in a charismatic group. There are lots of different ways to have a deeper experience of the Holy Spirit. So um, to answer the question the way you put it, no, you don't have to join a charismatic group to have a deeper experience of the Holy Spirit. You can have it just praying on your own, or through the sacraments, um, but uh, I would be at least a little cautious about using the term spirit baptism or baptism in the spirit and fire for that, because even though you, you can refer to a, a deep experience of the Holy Spirit with those terms, the Church doesn't forbid you to, it's also not exactly the way they seem to be being used in Scripture. Thank you, Allie. We go now to Joan in Staten, Oregon. Uh, yeah, you are on, Joan, uh, with Jimmy Aiken. Hi. Um, Hi. I was listening to a debate uh, with Trent Horn and James White the other day. Okay. And I know um, the one. he, yeah, <laughs> and he was talking about the grace of final perseverance, mm -hmm. um, and that seemed to it seemed to be in contradiction with what I thought the Catholic Church taught about. Um, all graces necessary for salvation are available to everyone, but we get to choose whether we cooperate with them or not. Okay. And it seems like the grace of final perseverance would be one of those. Yeah. And it wouldn't just be given to some and not to others. It would be available to everyone. So mm -hmm. um, I just want to... So there are a couple of different ways of looking at this. Now, in that debate, Trent was dealing with someone who was coming from a Calvinist perspective, and so it would be natural for Trent to um, use those, or to refer primarily to those Catholic views, because there's more than one Catholic view on this, that are similar to the Calvinist view, so he wouldn't have to get too far afield. Um, basically, the Church has, in its official documents, used the language, gift of final perseverance. That's used, for example, in the Council of Trent's decree on justification. But there's more than one view of how that grace works. Um, according to one school of thought, according, for example, to Thomists, and their position is somewhat similar to Calvinism, um, according to Thomists, the gift of final perseverance is intrinsically efficacious. And that means that it works just because of the nature of the grace itself. So if God gives you the grace of final perseverance, you will finally persevere. And other people who aren't given the grace of final perseverance, they won't finally persevere. The other view, though, is that it's, it's extrinsically efficacious, which may, means that it's made effective by our free cooperation with it. So in that case, God could give everybody the opportunity to finally persevere, and that grace would be made effective if we choose to respond positively to that offer. Uh, hope that helps in the short space of time I've had. Thank you very much, Joan. Uh, tomorrow on Catholic Answers Live, Healing After Divorce with Rose Sweet and Does Science Need Christ with Dr. Stacy Trasankos. 888-318-7884 is the number. It'll still be the number tomorrow, so call then. Jimmy Aiken, thanks.
Thank you. That was a fun hour. Yeah. Or two hours. Two it was hours. Fun two hours. But it was like Twice a fun hour fun. on top of another fun hour. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow on Catholic Answers Live. Thanks for being with us. Thank you.